Hello dear listeners, thanks for tuning in to this first video in a series of videos in which I will try and explain and interpret existential philosophical concepts using Star Wars as a phenomenological basis. This series of videos is going to be a sidetrack from the close reading videos on Heidegger's basic questions that I was doing and the aim being that these videos will be more approachable because the close reading videos uh, on Heidegger are more like an advanced academic level and these videos will be more approachable and also maybe for me a bit more fun because I get to delve into the hundreds of Star Wars books that I read and try and make explicit the relation between the phenomenological and existential concepts that I'm used to deal with by relating it to these Star Wars novels. When I started thinking about what kind of concepts and ideas I could deal with, I came up with six, with six videos in which I cover a wide variety of ideas. And this is the overview that I made. So we see that the first three videos are gonna deal with Kierkegaard, uh, and firstly with his paradox of existence, Secondly, with what he calls the teleological suspension of the ethical. Uh, both of these ideas are primarily uh, discussed in his work Fear and Trembling. And the third one is also going to be related to Fear and Trembling, namely to his idea of the Night of Faith. Then I plan on doing two videos on Heidegger, namely uh, one on the idea of the force and how certain aspects of it can also be understood by using Heidegger's notion of attunement. And just like in all the videos, Star Wars is gonna be the phenomenological basis by which we can get a better grasp of the concept that we're gonna be dealing with. And this is also the case for the second video on Heidegger, uh, the fifth in the series in which I will discuss Aletheia and the way in which the Force could help us understand what Heidegger means when he says that Aletheia is a way of understanding truth as this closedness. And then in the sixth video I'll deal with Dostoevsky and this is based on one remark that Hubert Dreyfus makes in a lecture course on uh, the brothers Karamazov and basically he says at some point that Dostoevsky has the idea that coming back from the brink, so coming back from a troubled past and being reborn is crucial in being molded as a good person. And I think that this is something that is also present in the Star Wars novels because thieves, criminals, smugglers and Luke Skywalker's wife, for instance, Mara Jade, all have a shady past and somehow it's and for some reason one sees that it is their having stood beyond the boundaries of what is normally accepted that has shaped and molded them positively and also helps them to understand the other side but this of course will all be discussed in more detail in each video before i start out discussing the subject matter of this first video I will first give some general remarks on the format that I'll be using for these videos. So in general, I'll be quoting a lot from the Star Wars novels and from the philosopher whose concepts we're trying to grasp. Now, this means that I'll be doing a lot of reading, just like in the closed reading videos. And this has a purpose because I think only by staying very close to the text can we develop an interpretation that is true to what is actually being written and thought. Additionally, and in contrast to the other closed reading videos, I'll try and show the passages that I'll be reading as I read them in the video. In this way, I hope it will be easier to follow, especially if it's a long passage that I'm reading. All right, with that, I've made all the remarks that I wanted to make before we could start with the first video. So here we go. Today, I want to talk about Anakin and the way in which he embodies what the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard calls the paradox of existence. 
My discussion will consist of three parts. I'll start out by giving a general introduction of Anakin so that we have insight those aspects of his life that are going to be essential in understanding what Kierkegaard means with the paradox of existence. In the second part, I will focus on two main things that return throughout the different books that are written on Anakin's life. Namely, first of all, the way in which his love for his mother and Padme shapes him and could be understood as a, to use jargon, unconditional commitment. I'll explain this later in more detail. And secondly, the way in which the myth of the sun dragon which Shmi, Anakin's mother, told him as a child, forms his relation to these unconditional commitments and the way in which he understands himself. On the basis of these two central themes in the Star Wars novel, namely Anakin's defining commitments and the myth of the sun dragon, I will be able to show how this is indicative of central ideas in Kierkegaard's philosophy that lead up to and are required to understand what he means with the paradox of existence. This is going to be the basic structure of this talk and with that I'm going to start with the general introduction of Anakin Skywalker. Anakin Skywalker first makes his appearance in The Phantom Menace in which he crosses path with Qui-Gon Jinn, Obi-Wan and Padme Amidala who are looking for a hyperdrive engine they end up on Tatooine, on which Anakin is a slave boy working in a shop that deals in all sorts of mechanical parts. All the details do not really matter for us, but what does matter is that Qui-Gon Jinn especially notices that Anakin is incredibly strong in the Force. So strong that Qui-Gon Jinn suspects that he might be the chosen one who is spoken of in Force prophecies to bring balance to the Force. Because Qui-Gon Jinn feels so strongly that Anakin might be the chosen one, he wants to bring him back to Coruscant and let him join the Jedi Order. But this leads to a big discussion and this is important for our purposes because Jedi live according to a philosophy of asceticism. They understand themselves as serving the Force and not themselves. So from fairly early on, they bring up younglings to not have any attachments and taking them away from their parents is a very important aspect of that because they do not form an emotional relationship to someone very close to them. And again, being at the age of nine when Qui-Gon Jinn finds him has already formed those attachments and this is why uh, the Jedi Council is very hesitant to allow him into the Order. In the end, a combination between Qui-Gon Jinn's trust in Anakin Anakin's connection to the Force and the events that transpire lead to Anakin being allowed to join the Jedi Order. There have been written about 15 books on the years between The Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. And in these 15 books, Anakin's struggles as a Padawan are a central theme. And his struggles vary, but mainly they have to do with his attachment to his mother, competition with other Jedi, and the need to prove himself constantly. And these are ways of relating to others and himself that other Jedi do not have, because they have been brought up very differently from Anakin. In addition, other Padawans and other Masters notice this in Anakin, and this leads to him being somewhat of an outcast, someone who is not always trusted. And as one might expect, this leads to a strengthening of the struggles. To give an indication of Anakin's hardships, I would like to point to the novel The Approaching Storm. In this novel, Anakin and Obi-Wan travel to another planet with another Master Padawan team for political reasons relating to the upcoming Clone Wars. Throughout the book, they have to locate a certain nomad people, and as they come across other peoples, at some point they are asked to show that they have souls. And what Anakin does, so he has to give a small performance, he sings a song that his mother sang to him. This, in connection with some mishaps that Anakin makes throughout their journey, leads to a conversation between the Master and Padawan team that accompany Obi-Wan. And this conversation might help to see how troubled Anakin is. 
Here's the conversation between Master Luminara and Apprentice Barris. All Jedi are lonely to one degree or another, Padawan. You would learn that soon enough. The difference lies in the degree. There are those who are more comfortable with an ascetic lifestyle than others. Within the rules, there is some flexibility. You simply have to seek it out. Barris looked to the other side of the fire. Is that what Anakin is trying to do? Find flexibility? Sensitive she was, Luminara marveled. Her Padawan was going to make an exceptional healer. He's certainly searching for something, answers to questions he hasn't yet formed. Whether he can find enough of them to make him happy remains to be seen. I've spoken to Obi-Wan about it. He isn't sure either. He knows only that his Padawan has enormous potential. Barris rose. Potential that goes unrealized is potential that might as well not exist in the first place. From her recumbent position, Luminara looked up into the night. Don't be so quick to judge, Barris. Some of us suffer from greater uncertainties than others. I would as soon have Anakin Skywalker by my side in a fight as any Padawan I have ever met. In a fight, yes, master, at other times. She left the thought unfinished as she pivoted and walked back to her own sleeping place. In this passage we see some of how the other Jedi view Anakin. On the one hand, they experience his good-willed nature and his incredible ability to fight and help others. On the other hand, they experience how troubled he is and how emotionally unstable he is. And since being centered and not being overly affected is crucial in being a Jedi, there are Jedi that doubt that Anakin should have ever been accepted into the Order. Even though his time as a Padawan is definitely not easy, Anakin reaches some sort of peace and becomes a knight that is respected and valued. But the events in Attack of the Clones form a definite turning point in Anakin's existence. In this part of the story two crucial things happen. The first is that his mother dies and the second is that he marries Padme. Anakin's actions in relation to his mother speak very well for the kind of grip that his attachments have on him. After seeing a vision of his mother dying, he drops everything, travels to Tatooine and finds indeed that his mother has been taken by Tusken Raiders. As he locates her while she is dying, he completely slaughters the whole camp of Tusken Raiders. Even though this is not spelled out in the tale, I believe that Anakin's love for Padme is the only thing that keeps him from completely melting down at that point in time. Anakin's complete devotion to the war and more importantly to Padme help him to keep him occupied and to focus his emotions in such a way that he can continue functioning as a Jedi. That is, until his vision of Padme dying in childbirth, but more of that later. This brings me to the second part for this discussion, in which I focus on two aspects of Anakin's life that both are central to understanding the importance of Anakin's relation to Padme and to himself. First I draw on several passages from the novel Revenge of the Sith and Brotherhood, which is set just after the Attack of the Clones. I do this in order to show that Anakin can only be understood in terms of his relation to others and that Padme is what we might call Anakin's unconditional commitment which is another way of saying that their love is the basis for their identity. This will be important for the connection that I'll be making with Gigagard's philosophy. Let's first look at the passage from Revenge of the Sith in which Padme is described. This passage is not only deeply touching because it touches the heart of Anakin's and Padme's love for each other, it also describes the essence of their unconditional commitment as an identity-granting relation. On page 130 of Revenge of the Sith, it says, She is Anakin Skywalker's wife. Yet wife is a word too weak to carry the truth of her. Wife is such a small word, such a common word, a word that can come from a down to mouth with so many petty, unpleasant echoes. For Padme Amidala, 
saying, I am Anakin Skywalker's wife, is saying neither more nor less than saying, I am alive. Her life before Anakin belonged to someone else, some lesser being to be pitied, some poor, impoverished spirit who could never suspect how profoundly life should be lived. Her real life began when she looked into Anakin Skywalker's eyes. The importance of this passage lies in the fact that it explicitly draws connection between Padme's identity and her love for Anakin. Padme is only who she is because of the meaning that Anakin's existence has granted her. Her love radiates so strongly that her world only began as she looked Anakin in the eyes. Thus, her love determines who she is and what she is to do. And this is the essence of the meaning of the phrase unconditional commitment. Padme is unconditionally committed to Anakin in a way that it determines fully who she is and what she is to do, how her world looks, why she undertakes certain actions or why she shouldn't. Especially the phrase saying I am Anakin Skywalker's wife is saying neither more nor less than saying I am alive rings true to the essence of the idea of the unconditional commitment. It is that relation, that commitment that determines everything of who she is. In a similar fashion we find in the fourth chapter of the recently published novel Brotherhood the following passage. Anakin shut it all out to be with his wife. His wife. Such a thought, such a definition still seemed unreal to him. Now this passage of course expresses less clearly the idea of the unconditional commitment. But the use of the word definition might make it possible to interpret it in this way. For a definition is something that defines and saying that the definition of being his wife and the relation that there are in is a definition that is still unreal to him is a way of saying that the determination of their world lies in the fact that they are defined as man and wife this can be put differently by saying that the definition is also a signification and a signification has to do with significance so being defined as man and wife is completely intertwined with the significance, the meaning-giving element that this entails. I found one more passage in Brotherhood that expresses this idea regarding Anakin more clearly. On page 24 it says, Really, that was all that mattered. Galactic peace, Obi-Wan's safety, Palpatine's stability, all of those things were important. But when layer by layer was stripped away, the only thing that truly mattered to Anakin's sun dragon heart was Padme. So what I want to take away from these passages is that Anakin and Padme, their world, who they are, is explicitly described as being completely determined by their relation to each other. In other words, they're unconditionally committed to each other and this is the basis for their understanding of their selves and the world. Part 2, Section 2, The Myth of the Sand Dragon Having shown that Anakin's and Padme's love is described as world-giving, I will now move on to the second aspect of Anakin's existence that is required to understand its relation to Kierkegaard's paradox of existence. In the last red passage, Anakin's heart is described as a sun dragon. This refers to a story that Shmi told Anakin as a little boy and has formed his self-understanding from then on. In this longer passage from Brotherhood, Anakin explains the myth to a youngling. Yes, this story is one of my earliest memories. Anakin hesitated, the confluence of different emotions stealing his breath for a moment. It's about the Tatooine myth, the sun dragon. The sun dragon is a beast that lives inside a star, guarding everything it treasures. Nothing could hurt it. Not fire, not flame. 
it survived through the most impossible circumstances, even life in the core of a star. Because the sun dragon had the biggest heart in the galaxy, a burning furnace powerful enough to protect everything and everyone it loved. My mother used to tell me the story in different ways. A celebration for good days, a lesson for bad days. But it always returned to one thing, the most important thing. Your heart can take you where you want to go. Where you need to go. Because it is strong enough. That's why I'm telling you now. Anakin put his hand on his shoulders, just as Qui-Gon Jinn had so many years ago. You are strong enough. Through everything we've faced in the past few days, you've shown me exactly who you are. You're brave, you're smart, and you have a unique gift, unlike any I've encountered within the Order. You can do anything your heart wants. This is found in chapter 50 of Brotherhood. For Anakin, the myth of the sun dragon embodies the idea that there is a power inside him with which he is capable to save and to care for everything that is important to him. In the other passage read in Brotherhood, it says that Anakin has a sun dragon heart. And as the embodiment of this myth, he believes that he, as long as he wills strong enough, is able to save anything and everything. And this is the same advice that he gives to the youngling. You can do anything your heart wants. Between the lines we might read, the only obstacle is your own willfulness. As long as you give everything you have, things will come through. However, at some point in Anakin's and Obi-Wan's travels, they encounter a Death Star. And this encounter and the conversation that Anakin has with Obi-Wan in the star system greatly disturbs Anakin. I will now read the passage in Revenge of the Sith in which this is explained. Anakin sometimes thinks of the dread that eats at his heart as a dragon. Children on Tatooine tell each other of the dragons that live inside the suns. Smaller cousins of the sun dragons are supposed to live inside the fusion furnaces that power everything from starships to pod races. But Anakin's fear is another kind of dragon, a cold kind. A dead kind. Not nearly dead enough. Not long after he became Obi-Wan's Padawan, all those years ago, a minor mission had brought them to a dead system. One so immeasurably old that this star had long ago turned to a frigid dwarf of hyper-compacted trace metals, hovering a quantum fraction of a degree above absolute zero. Anakin couldn't even remember what the mission might have been. But he had never forgotten that that star. It had scared him. Stars can die? It is the way of the universe, which is another matter of saying that it's the will of the force, Obi-Wan had told him. Everything dies. In time, even stars burn out. This is why the Jedi form no attachments. All things pass. To hold on to something or someone Beyond its time is to set your selfish desires against the Force. That is a path of misery, Anakin. The Jedi do not walk it. This is the kind of fear that lives inside Anakin Skywalker. The dragon of the dead star. It is an ancient, cold, dead voice within his heart that whispers all things die. In bright day he can't hear it. Battle, a mission, even a report before the Jedi Council can make him forget it's even there. But at night, at night, the walls he has built sometimes start to frost over. Sometimes they start to crack. At night, the dead star dragon sometimes sneaks through the cracks and crawls up into his brain and chews at the inside of his skull. The dragon whispers of what Anakin has lost and what he will lose. The dragon reminds him every night of how he held his dying mother in his arms, of how she had spent her last strength to say, I knew you would come for me, Anakin. The dragon reminds him every night 
that he will lose Obi-Wan. He will lose Padme. Or they will lose him. These passages in Revenge of the Sith are just incredible. They say exactly what they should say. And they connect every little aspect of Anakin's existence so incredibly well. So if you have not read the book yet, I would really insist that you do. But for now, let's continue with the discussion at hand. With this passage, we can make the connection between, on the one hand, Anakin's and Padme's unconditional commitment. Their whole world, who they are, is determined by the relation that they have to each other, by the meaning-giving or significance-giving relation. On the other hand, Anakin has experienced the fragility of existence, and by seeing the Death Star and having the conversation with Obi-Wan, he is confronted with the fact that everything is mortal and more importantly that the mortality of everything is something that he has no control over. It is only when we take these two aspects together that we can see the true misery of Anakin's existence. If the whole of your world is determined in its significance by something that is mortal and that means that at any point your whole world can collapse. That at any point everything that you are, everything that you live for is gone. It is this fact of existence that the Jedi guard against by not taking any attachments. However, since Anakin was accepted in the Order later and is bound by his attachments, his world is determined by his relation to others. He is confronted with this fact and he cannot relate to it properly. Our discussion so far can be briefly put in the following way. Anakin's love determines who he is and he is faced with the fragility of the basis for his existence or more accurately he cannot face the fragility of the basis for his existence. We now have everything we need to try and uncover the relation between Anakin's existence and Kierkegaard's paradox of existence. Section 3. Kierkegaard and the Paradox of Existence In this final section I will use Anakin as a basis for understanding Kierkegaard's paradox of existence and afterwards I will show the different ways in which Kierkegaard thought that we could relate to the paradox. But first we need to establish the parallels between Anakin's situation and Kierkegaard's understanding of the situation of man in general. And for this, we should look at the famous definition of man in the introduction of the sickness unto death. On page 9 of my translation, Kierkegaard writes, Man is spirit. But what is spirit? Spirit is the self. But what is the self? The self is a relation which relates itself to its own self. Or it is that in the relation that the relation relates itself to to its own self. The self is not a relation, but that the relation relates itself to its own self. Man is a synthesis of the infinite and the finite, of the temporal and the eternal, of freedom and necessity. In short, it is a synthesis. A synthesis is a relation between two factors. So regarded, man is not yet a self. To keep up the pace of this discussion, I will not interpret this passage in detail. For our purposes, we merely need two ideas. And the first is that man is a relation that relates itself to the relation that one is. And two is that man has to relate itself to its possibilities and its necessities. According to Kierkegaard, every human being, while living their lives, relates oneself to the synthesis that one is. We have to relate ourselves, for instance, to the synthesis of possibility and necessity. As human beings, we have the potential to make choices and to use a freedom of choice to choose certain possibilities. However, we are also bound by the limits of ourselves and the world. We have a lot of physical limitations. We have not chosen where we grew up and which laws and customs bind our actions. As an individual, we stand within these extremes and have to relate ourselves to them. In the sickness unto death, Kierkegaard tries to show 
how an excess or the lack of either of the two opposed relata makes us sick in the sense that we are not in tune with the being that we in a sense are. Consider, for instance, the sickness of the soul due to little necessity and too much possibility. In the Sickness unto Death, page 37, Kierkegaard writes, Nor is it merely due to a lack of strength when the soul goes astray in possibility. At least, this is not to be understood as people commonly understand it. What really is lacking is the power to obey, to submit to the necessary in oneself, to what may be called one's limit. A sickness of this kind stems from the inability to accept one's limits and to believe oneself to be capable of more than the world allows. The sun dragon myth is the expression of this sickness. In that it portrays an unreal ideal of the possibility of everything, so that the necessity in oneself and the world is lost from view. Anakin's encounter with the Death Star is the confrontation with the necessity of the synthesis that we are. This experience brings back some of the necessity in the relation that Anakin has to himself. Anakin regains some of the true understanding of who he is as a human being, but the downside is that it leads to fearing the inevitable end of this world and his defining commitment. And additionally, to holding on to this defining commitment in such a way that it's detrimental to Padme. The problem that we are now faced with can be stated as follows. How can we be true to our limitations as human beings and experience the necessity in ourselves and the world as the inevitable fragility of everything and still commit ourselves in such a way that our whole being is determined by this commitment? In a way, Anakin is the embodiment of this problem and the relation between the myth of the sun dragon and the encounter of the Death Star are both the outer extremes of, on the one hand, the infinite possibility and an infinite trust in our capability to save everything and everyone, and on the other hand, the fact that even stars burn out, that everything is finite. And in Star Wars, we at least in this point in the story, we do not really find an answer. But interestingly enough, we do find an answer in another of Kierkegaard's works, namely fear and trembling. So for an answer to this question, we will look at fear and trembling in which Kierkegaard discusses this problem in detail. For this discussion, it suffices to start at page 49 of my copy, in which he gives a description of what I have been calling an unconditional commitment, which is a term I'm borrowing from Professor Hubert Dreyfus. But before we look at fear and trembling, I would just wish to show three passages from either or another of Kierkegaard's works that support my interpretation of the unconditional commitment in more detail. On page 334 we find, Is loving you not loving a world? And on 336, I let oblivion consume all that has nothing to do with you, and then discover an ancient, a divinely young, elemental hand. I discover that my love for you is as old as myself. And then on 341, love is everything. So, for one who loves, everything has ceased to have meaning in itself, and only means something through the interpretation that love gives. What we find here is a clear basis for the understanding of love and the all-encompassing significance that love could have on someone's life that is clearly expressed in the way Anakin's love for Padme and Padme's love for Anakin is described in the different novels that I have discussed. Now, in Fear and Trembling, on page 49, Kierkegaard writes, A young lad falls in love with a princess. The content of his whole life lies in its love, yet the relationship is one that cannot possibly be brought to fruition, be translated from ideality into reality. The slaves of misery, the frogs in life's swamp, naturally exclaim, Such love is foolishness. The rich brewer's widow is just as good and sound a match.
Besides giving a clear account of the idea that love determines the whole of his life, Kierkegaard leads up to a discussion of what one could do when this love has no place in this world. I wish to interpret this passage broader by taking it not only to mean a factual situation in which the love cannot sprout, but also the fact that, at any time and without any indication, the love could come to an end. Kierkegaard holds that there are three ways to relate to this problem of existence. I will discuss them in turn. On page 52 of Fear and Traveling, Kierkegaard writes, Fools and young people talk about everything being possible for a human being. But this is a great mistake. Everything is possible spiritually speaking, but in a finite world there is much that is not possible. This is probably the best explanation that Kierkegaard gives of the lowest relation man can hold to the fragility of his existence. People who have not experienced hardships and children who believe themselves to be able to overcome every obstacle believe they can, by their own command, conquer the world and everything that might harm their commitment, have a naive and simply untrue understanding of their capabilities. Here again we see the directive of the myth of the Sun Dragon Return. Since it's factually untrue that we can control the world and everything that happens, this relation to the fragility of our existence can only be held until the inevitable moment comes that one is faced with the destruction of one's world. Additionally, Kierkegaard believes that people on this level usually do not commit oneself at all, for they merely relate to the world in a fleeting, shallow manner. The second stage Kierkegaard calls the Night of Infinite Resignation. This is his name for the one who, as a response to a rational understanding of the fragility of the world or as a response to a factical destruction of one's world, turns one's commitments into something mental. On page 50, Kierkegaard explains, This is not the manner of the night of infinite resignation. He does not renounce the love, not for all the glory in the world. On 53 he continues, he keeps his love young and it grows within him in years and beauty. On the other hand, he needs no finite occasion for its growth. From the moment he made the movement, the princess is lost. He needs none of this erotic titillation of the nerves at the sight of the loved one, etc. Nor does he need in a finite sense to be continually making his farewell for his memory of her is an eternal one, and he knows very well that those lovers who are so eager to see one another one more time to say farewell are right to be eager, right to think it will be the last time, for as soon as may be they will have forgotten one another. He has grasped the deep secret that even in loving another one should be sufficient unto oneself. He pays no further finite attention to what the princess does, and this just proves that he has made the movement infinitely. In short, the Knight of Infinite Resignation recognizes the utter fragility of everything that he could commit himself to, and, in having understood this fact of our existence, turns the commitment from the temporal into an eternal mental ideal that can always remain the basis for one's world. Kierkegaard states clearly that making the commitment mental means that the temporal basis no longer has any meaning. It is no longer the love for the person that guides one's world. Instead, it has become a mental ideal that has taken its place. This movement completely severs all ties to the finite world. While this movement counters the fragility of the world, it is not desirable, because the true significance of the world is lost. Those who make this movement have ended up with too much possibility and are therefore in despair. Kierkegaard thinks that we are able to make one more movement after having made the movement of infinite resignation, through which we have the infinite meaning of the love and the finite origin of our love at the same time. Kierkegaard calls the one who makes this second movement the night of faith. 
On page 56, he discusses the Knight of Faith, and he writes, Let us now have the Knight of Faith make his appearance in the case discussed. He does exactly the same as the other knight. He infinitely renounces the claim to the love which is the content of his life. He is reconciled on the pain. But then comes the marvel. He makes one more movement, more wonderful than anything else. For he says, I nevertheless believe that I shall get her, namely on the strength of the absurd, on the strength of the fact that for God all things are possible. Thus the Knight of Faith has experienced the problem of our existence and has fully grasped that everything we commit ourselves to will come to an end without being able to influence this fact. And yet he believes that everything will be alright. But what does this mean exactly? For this I would like to look at one more passage. The absurd is not one distinction among others embraced by the understanding. It is not the same as the improbable, the unexpected, the unforeseen. The moment the knight resigned, he was convinced of the impossibility, humanly speaking. That was the conclusion of the undertaking, and he had energy enough to think it. On this the knight of faith is just as clear. All that can save him is the absurd, and this he grasps by faith. Faith is therefore no ecstatic emotion, but something far higher, exactly because it presupposes resignation. It is not the immediate inclination of the heart, but the paradox of existence. The crucial difference between the night of infinite resignation and the night of faith is the night of faith's ability to answer the absurd, to go beyond every understanding of the world and irrationally trust in the possibility of the impossible. To truly grasp what it means to make this movement, it has to be clearly distinguished from mere ignorance in the form of believing in the improbable or the unforeseen. I usually give the following metaphor to bring this across. Being a knight of faith is like jumping from a cliff, fully realizing that humanly speaking it is completely necessary that you will die and yet you believe that you will be fine. This is the absurd, only on the grounds of an unthinkable and irrational trust in something other than oneself can one believe that everything will be alright. Living in terms of the absurd is the paradox of existence, of existing in a way in which one is fully committed to one's unconditional commitment knowing that one is completely helpless in the face of its fragility. Returning to Anakin's relation to his unconditional commitment, we are now able to see how these different levels of possible relations to one's world-giving commitments are present within Anakin's life. The myth of the Sun Dragon moves him to an understanding of himself as an all-powerful god who can annihilate the fragility of the world. Encountering a Death Star, his mother's death and his vision of Padme's death confront him with the fact that he does not have the power to save everyone and is thus confronted with a necessity in himself. In the remainder of Revenge of the Sith, we see how Anakin holds on to the idea that, as long as he has enough knowledge and power of the Force, he will save Padme. But, in the end, he is unable to make the movement of the infinite resignation, a movement that most other Jedi have made. By holding on to the directive of the Sun Dragon myth, Anakin is consumed by his ability to save his world, leading to an eternal despair of the soul. To conclude, what I wish to show in this discussion is that Kierkegaard could help us to gain a deep understanding of Anakin, especially when focusing on his love for Padme and the influence of the Sun Dragon myth and his encounter with the dead sun on his self-understanding. With this I would like to round off the first video in a series of videos in which I try to explain existential philosophical concepts using Star Wars as a phenomenological basis. I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you've got any tips or suggestions please comment or send me an email. That's it for now, I hope you all stay well and see you soon.